So now, I would like to invite our panelists up. We have a very distinguished panel, and we're going to have conversations, not only with us, but with you, about how do we move transparency and learning forward in the environment we're dealing with today. So, panelists, please join me. figure out where to sit. Look. <laughs> next to me, there you go. I'll be next to you. Okay. All good. So, uh, you know, uh, you can see the names of the panelists on here. They are all international experts in this area. And as we go through, uh, I'll just highlight them as I call them out. And, you know, Alan, I, I want to start with you. You've had an illustrious career. Uh, Alan spent many years up in the Boston area and, and research and publications and really understanding the dynamics involved here. We're excited he's recently come to Maryland at Hopkins and it will give us a chance to work closer together in overseeing the Armstrong Institute and quality and safety for Hopkins. But share with us what you've learned through your 15, 18 years of trying to figure this legal scenario out. Sure. Um, well. As you pointed out, I think what we've all really come to learn is that it really is an ethical and a professional imperative that when things go wrong, we let people know what happened. We let the patients know what happened, and then, of course, apologize and then take steps to make it better so it doesn't happen to the next patient. Uh, you know, what I've seen over the last 20 years is a remarkable shift when you talk to clinicians or people involved in healthcare. When I used to ask them, is disclosing the right thing to do, there used to be debate about 20 years ago. Now, today, when you put that question in front of everybody, everybody says, absolutely, it ought to be done. Of course, the challenge lies in what you were talking about, which is if you ask them then, well, does everybody disclose? And of course, everybody says, well, my hospital does, but others don't. That's always the challenge that you hear. Um, I think what we've seen over the last, um, in more recent times, is we're seeing a bigger push around transparency, just as we've seen in society in general. I think people are getting behind the concept more because they've also realized that if we don't know what's broken, we can't make it any better. People have really locked into that concept as well. And we're starting to see now, as people keep complaining about the liability issues, we're starting to see more and more data come out to show that even if liability is a concern, it shouldn't be. We've now seen at least four or five systems publish their data on what happens to claims and expenses after they start these types of programs, candor type programs or that what was done at the University of Michigan. And what we've seen is your liability doesn't get worse. In fact, in many cases, the claims go down, the amount you pay to your lawyers goes down, and it turns out patients tend to be very happy with these programs for obvious reasons. So we're starting to see more and more um, growth in these types of programs and this concept. And I think that's where we're going. I'm hopeful we'll get better at this with time. Yeah, great, thanks. Jonathan, I'm gonna turn to you. Uh, known you for a number of years. Jonathan's been a national um, reputation in plaintiff's attorney, um, severe. You know, what do patients and families tell you when they walk through the door? And what do you hear on a constant basis that you could share with everyone? First of all, I think I need to be on the other side of the table. As the only plaintiff's lawyer in the room, it's a little itchy over here. <laughs> well, I've been at medical negligence for 44 years as a trial lawyer. Most of us are dead. It's rather stressful. And the question comes up is, why do people come to us other than the medical mistake? Because the medical mistakes, I know we're driving to zero, I'm all in. I'm with MedStar, I'm doing my best to help. But why did they come? Well, here's why they come. Because the predominant climate in the United States today is hostile. It's adversarial. It's destructive. It's horrible for the injured patient and family. Why? Because typically what happens is when a medical mistake occurs, no one does come to the patient or the family, if appropriate, 
And no one tells them what happened, truthfully. I'm going to be honest with you people. They're lied to. There's a lot of lying going on out there. And in 44 years, I've seen literally thousands of instances. So what happens? A medical mistake occurs. The hospital goes into lockdown. The records are sent to risk management. What's that mean? The patient can't get them. Succeeding healthcare providers have trouble getting them. Sometimes they're redacted, a little patient dumping. Sometimes they're altered secretly. It happens. The patient's not told anything. The patient becomes disillusioned, angry, betrayed by their own system. Don't forget, I'm old. We had Marcus Welby. Anybody remember Marcus Welby? <laughs> he was on a pedestal. Everybody loved their caregiver. Why? Truthful, responsive, telephone calls were not ignored. Rudeness didn't occur. My favorite rude story in 44 years. We had a gentleman who's the victim of medical malpractice. Goes up to his doctor, because the doctor didn't tell him he was the victim of medical malpractice, and says, doctor, what happened? And the doctor says, I'm busy, you've got 15 seconds. Ask me what you want. Well, it's a true story. How does that play with the patient? So the patient starts out as your ally. The patient is deeply respectful of everybody. The patient is depending upon you to heal them. An untoward event, we're going to use some of the language I've heard, occurs, synonymous with medical malpractice or medical negligence, and your system shuts down. When the patient needs the help most, which is after this event, the patient may need a hospital bed, the patient may need rehab, the patient may need custodial help, the patient may need occupational services, the patient may need a host of help, then, and what happens? The system turns against them and turns them into the enemy. And then when the insurance interests get, become involved, I got plenty of stories. Their mantra is just say no. We can beat these people down, maybe they'll die. And when some of the insurance, not all, and certainly not MedStar, but when some of the insurance interests win a catastrophic case they know they should lose, what do they do? They celebrate. Believe me, I know. They go out and celebrate that that brain damaged baby that everyone knows they're responsible for will not be compensated. So I look at this system after I'm 72 years old, shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> we need to do something. We need to do something. And then I learned about candor, and I'm taking up too much time because lawyers do. And you did promise me some of your time. I did, <laughs> but I'm taking it back. There is, a <laughs> yeah. I'm there is a billable hour situation coming on here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. What do we do? This candor program that I was introduced to through, of course, David and Larry Smith, it's the exact opposite. The patients told the truth. What a refreshing notion for me. I don't have to fight through two, five, or seven years of lies to finally get to the truth. The patients told the truth, and then the patients cared for. The patient remains an ally of yours. The patient has a better outcome, and you save money. And your hair, uh, health care givers are not as depressed because they're helping. I took too much time. I apologize. Oh, thanks. But I flew 3,000 miles to tell you that. Peter, I'll... I'll uh, <laughs> do I have any time left? Yeah. <laughs> you don't need any time. <laughs> yeah, we don't the lawyer need said it all. <laughs> Peter, I'll turn to you next, and you can see Peter has uh, had a long career in, in safety and quality, but now is the current CEO for the International Society for Quality and Healthcare, ISQA, as it's known. Peter, uh, it, it is about redesigning and systems and processes, and, and how can we do that? What, what are ways we could accomplish uh, that? Yeah, well, if, if you listen to most of the talks today, it's about system design. Uh, Unfortunately, we have a system that is working for healthcare of 100 years ago. 
You used to go to your doctor and then to your priest, and that was it, and you didn't survive. Now, we've had a lot of success in people surviving and getting older, yet the whole model of healthcare has stayed the same. We divide people up, we, don't, uh, we look at different parts of the body, we don't look at people as a whole, we don't integrate care, and when things go wrong, everyone runs for the hills, just as you say, it's not my part of the problem, particularly nowadays with chronic disease. So the design of our whole system of delivering care is based on a model that doesn't fit what we require now. And with that is how we deal with things that go wrong, is that uh, doctors have this idea that we are always right in the old way and that we do not like failure. And it's very rare that in medical school you're taught to deal with failure. You're supposed to succeed, not dealing with harm. You're supposed to always deal with success. And yet when that happens, you don't know how to do it. So the system of delivering care needs to be redesigned for the current need of integrated chronic care. And you heard earlier from Peter Pronovost, care should not be in the hospital, but should be outside the hospital. However, the system here, as in the United Kingdom, in the United Kingdom mainly for political reasons, and here for financial reasons, hospitals are very unlikely to give up their expensive buildings and the expense of departments and integrate care to provide it in the community. It's either politically or financially just not possible unless there is the will. And finally, the business model is totally wrong. I don't believe we are in healthcare. Uh, I don't think healthcare is my business as a pediatrician. I believe safety is my business. However, if I speak to doctors and nurses and say, what do you do, they do not say, I'm there to keep my patients safe. They'll say, I'm there to heal them, I'm here to cure them. But really, we should be saying, this, the healthcare, this, we, we actually, our business is safety. We happen to care for patients as well, but we can't do it unless we do it safely. And that's what airlines do. If you go into an airline, they say, our business is safety, we happen to fly the plane as well. And until safety becomes what we do, then all we're doing is the band-aids onto the problem. Yeah, so great, thanks. And Mike, you see Mike Durkin is uh, from the UK, he's a senior advisor, has been in healthcare safety policy, legislation, clinical. Uh, Mike, add on to what Peter talked about around the systems and processes, specifically legislation and, and maybe education also, I know is very passionate for you. Yeah, thanks Dave. So, so I'd like to go back just a, 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 mm -hmm. a few years to our, our story in the UK to try and combat the growing harm that was um, uh, in place because we weren't paying attention to reducing uh, the chances of people getting a VTE uh, or a pulmonary embolus. And uh, we'd known, like many countries across the world, we'd known what to do uh, as clinical professionals but we were just too lazy to put them into practice. Um, and it took, in the UK, a partnership between patients, the public, and our parliamentarians, the politicians, to really drive that change to, first of all, start to be transparent in the data that was available. And it was only when we started to public report data on risk assessment processes across uh, the country that hospitals and individuals, particularly doctors, started to pay attention that they should be doing appropriate risk assessments and then appropriate prophylaxis to reduce VTEs and, and consequent pulmonary embolus. The really interesting thing for me, and I, I used to say it was a sad thing, but it's, it's an interesting thing I think now, was that um, when we knew what to do and we had the tools in place across a universal health coverage system, we were still only getting returns from about 40% of patients across the system that were gaining and getting a, 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 an assessment about their risk. We introduced a financial penalty, a financial incentive um, to align that incentivization process. And a bit like we heard earlier today, uh, within six months, we went from 40% risk assessments to 95% risk assessments. Uh, and so for me, that demonstrated that there was an opportunity for uh, the medical profession to recognize that they were only one part of 
the journey in terms of improving healthcare. And healthcare improvement is a partnership between all players in this. And most notably, and we have to say this, the patient and their family, and we've talked about it before, are the best experts of their own care and they're the best experts of their experience of care. We're not. We come in and play our own part. And I think we have to keep that central tenet every time we talk about trying to improve uh, and develop policy around this area of transparency. <clears throat> so we had a, a particular journey and we did well. I think I came into the post of, of, of uh, enabling VTE uh, improvement and then the National Patient Safety Improvement at the same time that uh, Jeremy Hunt came in as the Secretary of State. Uh, and I'd like to also reflect, therefore, that uh, no matter who is in the room, unless we have the representatives of the people in the room, at whatever level that is, that's a local level, na regional or national, and in this country it would be state level, um, then we lose the opportunity to make great changes. Because it is with that partnership that we can actually introduce huge change uh, and sustainable change. Um, although you might look at the UK at the moment uh, in terms of its uh, inability to come to a decision about uh, whether we want to be in or out of Europe, uh, uh, we still have a process of, of listening uh, to uh, the citizens of our people, of our population, <coughs> much more so than actually we do as doctors uh, and as healthcare workers. You know, we, so, so the other element for me in terms of policy development we have to really understand that whole process of communication and listening. So I just want to drift now into the answer your question, if I may, about the, the, the importance of policy development and the importance of listening to what is really uh, vital for, for change. We tried to start building our whole processes of being a transparent system by looking at what data was required. And we found that actually we didn't collect the data. Peter's point. We didn't collect the most appropriate data. So we've now introduced a system of, of, of quality data at, at a, a, down to a ward level, which everybody can, can have access to. But that still wasn't enough, because we also believed that we needed a duty of candor that wasn't just a professional individual duty, but was one for organizations to, to build. And we introduced this, this duty of candor at an organizational level, and Sean will attest to this, uh, about five years ago. But it's only in the last two, two years or so that organizations have been tested to demonstrate that they are sharing the data uh, with their organizations. Because often when a mistake is made, it's exactly the same point that Jonathan made. In our country, when a mistake is made in a hospital, the first drawbridge that goes up is usually the hospital side. Uh, trying to prevent exchange of information. Uh, we heard early from Jamie. Preventing exchange of information is, is at the cornerstone of most of the times where relationships break down. And when relationships break down, I have to say, sorry, Jonathan, the legal profession have a feeding frenzy. They're able to come in because we haven't got our act together in, in the first place. So we've introduced this organizational duty of candor. We felt, felt that was built on the fact that as professionals, in healthcare workers, whoever our, whatever our tribe was, we were held by this approach that we would actually also share when things went wrong. But we know we don't, because we're human beings and, and our, our esteem and our ego take over. Uh, so we, we are often fail our patients by not sharing that information. So we've actually now started to introduce that approach that actually the most important thing, going back to Peter Poniface's point, is, is that it's not necessarily your professional identity that drives you and drives your change, it's your ethical identity. And the ethical identity and the elements to which we can actually bring our own ethics to, to bear are those that not just look at the value and the drop in waste, but actually the values of those who are working together in a team. So for me, the whole, our whole answer to policy development is re-establish our ethical identity as a set of professionals working with our patients and our politicians. And you'll hear later, I think, from Steve in terms of the curriculum development, how important those challenges to our students are uh, in developing their further, further careers. But I'll come in later on no, other points. That's so. great, yeah. thanks. Jack, I'll turn to my hero last here, but probably most importantly, you and Teresa, despite the difficulties, travel across the country talking about this approach. Share why you do it and, and why this has become your mission. 
I want to first say that um, after watching the video, I'm not a fan of high definition. Video. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a CEO. I'm not a. I used to be CEO of my house, but my wife told me that is no longer. Um, you know, my, my purpose is if I can uh, tell my story, what happened, and the way uh, MedStar dealt with my um, medical error, um, and if I can reach one person um, and make a difference, and one administrator, one doctor, one nurse, about the importance of uh, patient safety. Um, you know, I went into surgery um, with the idea of uh, a little bit of pain in my right arm. And, um, well, in, in reality, I don't have the pain in the right arm anymore. Um, but I don't have anything in my right arm anymore. Um, MedStar uh, transparency made such a big difference in my life. Um, and that even from the operating room, uh, the surgeon called my wife, who was in the waiting room. Uh, operation was scheduled for an hour and a half, two hours at the most, and it ran about five hours. And my stay was to be overnight, and um, I got out about five months later. Um, well, it was the fact that the surgeon came out and sat down with myself, my wife, my siblings, my children, and explained to us exactly what happened and that it happened in his OR and he was responsible. And the president of the hospital came in and explained, and the uh, hospital uh, risk manager came in and said, anything you need, anything, you just ask for it and it's taken care of. And um, I had the idea that I was told that um, acute physical and um, therapy was what I needed and I wanted to get that and um, they provided it and it, those first couple months were critical and um, I wanted to give it a hundred percent so now I, um, I am such a believer in the, the transparent approach to medicine because it's through that transparency that the hospitals and the doctors learn because if everybody closes down, we go into the delay, deny, and defend process. Who learns from that? The doctors don't talk amongst themselves. Um, administrators don't. Um, everything becomes a clamshell. And by being open and transparent, not only with the patient and the family, but amongst themselves. Um, you know, the care for the caregiver is such a, a big part of this. They have people that they can go to, and, um, you know, they go into the profession to help, not to harm, and something has happened. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier about the 400 physician suicides a year. Um, some of that is a result of not being able to live with what they did. Um, in uh, patient harm. Um, and the last thing I just want to add, Dave, is we were talking this morning about zero, and um, we were asking for future, whether we should shoot the goal for uh, 2025 or 2030. I'm telling you now, 2020 should be doable. Um, these are the movers and the shakers. I'm so honored to be here in front of this type of national and international crowd of that can make things happen. And I'm begging you, please, for the sake of all patients in the future, take the message home and open, honest, transparency. Um, let's achieve zero medical error deaths in 
by 2020. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Let's go to some of the questions. There's some good ones here I wanted to share. And Alan, I'm going to go to you for the first one here. Um, what happens when, in cases or events that we don't know yet whether the care was substandard, yet something went in a direction it, we hadn't anticipated? How do you define that gray zone? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, and I think this is what causes a lot of consternation when people try to say that they're going to be transparent with their patients or set up systems like this. A and through, I've, I've been lucky to be involved in a couple organizations that have built these programs. And I think what we've learned is it's actually still pretty straightforward as to what you have to do in terms of best practice. When something's wrong, you go to the family and you say, look, we're sorry that you got harmed. We think something might be wrong here. We're not sure yet. We're going to investigate, and the key word here is quickly, and get right back to you. I think a lot of people think that these conversations with families are a one-time thing. They're not. They need to be ongoing conversations. But the key is to start them early and let, them, let patients and families know what you do know and don't know, because they're actually quite understanding of it. You don't want to wait till you do your complete investigation, because sometimes that could be six months later, and you realize you made a mistake. Showing up six months later after no word can be a little awkward, right? Yeah. So that's why we advise people, just sit down with the family, let them know you're going to look into it, and you'll get right back to them. Can, yes, can I just come in? So, so we're, we're good friends, OK? Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the, one of the uh, aspects that we found in the UK after spending the last three years, four years now, trying to uh, develop a, uh, an independent uh, safety investigation system uh, we've called it Healthcare Safety Investigation uh, Branch. It will be body soon. And, and, uh, and Scott helped with his experience uh, as one of the experts, uh, witnesses for that uh, developing program. We found that, uh, and subsequently since it's been started over the last 12 months, that a, one of the key aspects of safety investigations in hospitals is the variability of model that is taken up. Um, the inexpert approach to root cause analysis uh, and the inexpert approach to communicating an ongoing liaison with families uh, and the patients. So we've, we're starting to develop a, an exemplar model because we, we think if we leave it to the 500 or so hospitals that operate fairly independently across the UK, we'll end up with 500 different models because uh, that's what we have now. Yeah. So, um, so I think there is, a, uh, there is a real challenge across the world, actually, to, to look at some of the other high-risk industries that we've got uh, and see where they've taken us. Uh, and they have gone to usually one model uh, and, uh, and an adherence to that model uh, wherever you are. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the area for me, because I think otherwise we're doing our patients and our, uh, and our staff a disservice by not having a professionalized approach to safety investigations in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd support that, the, the need to have uh, clinical staff trained first to acknowledge something went wrong, and I think that's what Alan's saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the acknowledgement that something happened, not the explanation of what happened. Because often what happens is they theorize, this could have happened, this could have happened, and it's totally wrong, because they, they haven't done the investigation. And that's the kind of approach doctors get into, is uh, giving the answer before they know the answer of what could have happened, and the different differentials that they're taught to do yeah. to find out when they diagnose. So they go into diagnostic mode, uh, and then they're told to shut up because they, they're making the wrong diagnoses. Wow. So the, the way to go forward is firstly to acknowledge and then to give the path that's going forward. And uh, the model that we were using at Great Ormond Street was from Australia, the assist model mm. of really acknowledging, asking the patients to tell them the story. Yeah. What do you think happened? Mm. Yeah. What do you think should happen? This is what we will do. And this is the timeline and how often we'll come back. And it's very much like the candle system, but the idea is that you, to do that, you have to have trained people within the hospital who are know how to do that. And then, just as Jack said, the, the actual clinical team that uh, has been involved is traumatized as well. Yeah. And they're the second victim. And that kind of approach now needs to, uh, has to be addressed because if you don't care for the second victim, then you'll never get 
to the open a disclosure that you want them to give because they're so traumatized at the same time. Yeah. Well. And so the importance is to look at the trauma on both sides. And often, often it's as difficult for the, the victims and the families to, to accept that we also have to care for the victims on the other side who are part of this because two, two, peop two groups are involved. So the surgeon who causes the error or does the error, is, didn't do it deliberately necessarily, but is traumatized by the same problem. So it's a different kind of trauma, but if we really want to get this uh, synergy together between the patients and their families and the openness that we require, we need to go from both places, both sides. Yeah. But you have to have in every hospital the culture of openness and transparency that this is the way we do it. We acknowledge that something's gone wrong and we're going to find the cause. And we have a system mm. to do that that's reliable and is timely. Yeah. That is very important that it's timely. It doesn't take ages to actually look at it. But in the airline industry, if something goes wrong, the pilots make a report when they land. They don't go on holiday. They don't go away, they don't go playing golf, they don't go, go in, out of the hospital, uh, out of the system, they write their report because mm -hmm. the root cause starts immediately. Yeah. In healthcare, we're chasing after healthcare providers to provide the evidence. I know that Jonathan comes in here, but we often want to talk about the, uh, the causation being related to uh, uh, under-resourced uh, staffing teams. Mm -hmm but also the, the resourcing that goes behind the investigation of such instance is also hugely under-resourced. And as Jonathan mentioned, it's usually in, uh, someone d designated in a risk management role who then becomes the investigator holding it, usually at the end of one long, dark corridor where most clinicians and nurses don't want to go down, um, but that's an under-resourced element of the system as well. So if we're going to be looking at a whole system approach, it's not just resourcing on the wards, it's resourcing in looking into what has happened. Well, here in this country, the, the problem, one of, you may call it a problem, we don't have a transportation safety board for hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't have any independent evaluators. And so in my experience, it's very dependent, the entire process of the investigation is very dependent on who's doing it. So there are certain insurance carriers with whom I'm intimately familiar who can defend anything. After all, a colleague can find a colleague short of cutting off the wrong leg, and they, I got some people may argue that, to defend it. So this transparency and this honesty and this team to come in and do an investigation, part of the program has to be an honest investigation with board certified, hopefully, specialists who are not friends or relatives of the potential defendant and who are known to be able to dispassionately look at the facts and give an opinion. Otherwise, this system will not work. Yeah. Well, in reference to that, though, Dave, MedStar um, has created um, a GO Team. So when there is a a serious harm is committed. They have a GO team um, made up of, from the hospital, different disciplines who go and do an immediate evaluation. And whether it's uh, a medical error or not, they begin the process of covering medical expenses. Um, you know, I owe so much to uh, Larry Smith, um, who is the, you'll hear from tomorrow, who's the VP of uh, risk management, and Dave, um, for getting me where I am today. Um, but the GO team idea is experts respond to the scene of the uh, incident, make an incident evaluation right there within the first hour, and um, and down the road, they may do a six-month evaluation. They may come back and say, well, it really wasn't a medical error. Um, we're not going to ask the patient for to pay back uh, the things that we weighed or the items we may have given. But from this moment forward, it's, uh, we were operating within our proper guidelines, and uh, we'll move on from there. And I, I just think that's a fair way to do it. And let me just add a little bit more to that, Jack, and, and thanks, because it, it really, and, and for those interested in this candor toolkit that was developed by AHRQ, you can find it on the AHRQ site, and it's, 
It's composed of five different components, and, and through the MedStar Institute of Quality and Safety, Marty Hatley's here, Tim McDonald, others. We're working with over 300 hospitals in the United States now who are at different points of trying to implement all five components. Jack talks about the first team. One of the key components is training your organization around the term serious unanticipated outcome. Because if we wait, sometimes it could take us a week, a month to figure out whether our care was substandard. It could take labs, outside consult, but we activate once we get the serious unanticipated outcome, care went in a direction we hadn't anticipated, the phone call or the hotline is triggered and three go teams are activated. The first go team is that team that says, okay, we gotta pull together a team. And this, the event review go team is part of the candor toolkit. The event review I think is one of the best event reviews ever developed. It, is, it was developed by human factors experts, patient safety experts, and the National Transportation Safety Bureau, who came together, spent four months, looked at best practices, and it's designed to start the process. And as Jack says, there are safety and human factors people who do. We've eliminated the term investigation, because investigation sounds like I'm coming in to find who's at fault. It's an event review, and we want to understand and learn. So that team goes in, and they have nothing to do from a hierarchical or organization standpoint with that department. You can't have the chair of the department doing the event review. And this is a team that learns how to ask the five you know, W's, knows how to say we're here to learn from safety. A second GO team is activated for care for the caregiver. Separate set of people who engage with the care team. And then the third refers to what you're talking about. There are trained teams that we train up at hospitals that are your better communicators. We know in our hospitals there are people who we call our special communicators. They are not the type of people you want in these. And it's just in time training for people who've been involved in a serious unanticipated outcome because they want to hear from their doctor, from the nurse, whoever is the primary care, what just happened. And we train them. The first thing, we don't know what happened, but we make a commitment to them that we will find out. And as we learn, we will share. And if you've got questions, please share them with us. And we do that until we finally we do know. And it's a combination of first empathy and then if care was substandard, empathy with apology, but it does involve, like Jack said, bringing family members in. Larry Smith will share tomorrow because they thought dad would be home and now dad's gonna be in the hospital next week. Who's gonna pay for lost wages in those situations? If we wait for seven, eight, nine months out to start working settlements, Jack would tell you he'd have to remortgage his house just to pay for rehab and stuff. So, there's a whole comprehensive approach to this that I think is good. I want to get to, you know, one particular question. Jonathan, one for you. If we had, um, if healthcare hospitals or systems were willing to pay for care, regardless of how long it was needed afterwards, mm -hmm. should those be carved out of any other settlement where everybody's splitting the pie? Let me see if I understand this yeah. question. If, if a patient is given care after the event. Yeah, they agree that they're going to do the, if it takes five years or yeah. how longer, they well, agree to see, pay that. Here's, here's the issue, that, mm -hmm. and maybe someday, but today, no. And the reason is, boy, do we have disparate opinions on what level of care patients should get after being malpracticed upon, as some people would say. It's colloquialism. I don't say that. There's a big difference of opinion as to what this brain-damaged baby needs over the course of his or her life. I have never gone into litigation in 44 years when we've agreed with the defense as to what this costs. For example, the defense thinks that the mother and father ought to work for free for the rest of their lives, giving care to the child. Well, of course, what's the divorce rate? It's impossible. They need help. We believe that the child is going to need surgery. They always say no. This child's not going to need surgery. In fact, they come back and say, child's going to die anyway. We have all kinds of lifespan issues. So, no. It won't work until people can honestly work together and come up with a plan that makes some sense. We 
I consult with 500 board certified specialists and subspecialists in medicine and surgery in the United States. We try and use objective people and we put, use experts to put these plans together to, to give optimum care to the baby, not the lowest level of care or unacceptable care. And we've had a fundamental disagreement about that for 44 years. So, no. Great. No. Okay, so, so I have to declare a bit of an inter a conflict of interest here. I, I, I sit on a board, which, which in England it used to be called the NHS Litigation Authority, it's now called NHS Resolution. One of the key elements for our, that drives our litigation processes and our costs in the UK is uh, our neonatal injuries uh, related to, uh, to this scenario. And in looking at the data that we've found, and we've, we have uh, billions tied up, tens and tens of billions tied up in, in future costs for, for looking after children who've suffered from a neonatal injury, the biggest driver of cost has been the time uh, taken to res resolve the issue between the legal parties. And the amount of money that actually gets, then ends up going to the individual is, is hit hard by those legal costs. So our big driver, and, I, and I'll share it with you, Jonathan, about how we can do this. Our big driver is to reduce those legal costs so that more is taken up and available for the families. Because we do know that these children are living longer, living relatively healthy lives, because we're able to construct whole systems approaches around them. And that requires more funding. And they need the funding rather than the legal profession. So uh, I'll just speak as a pediatrician who's a neurodevelopmentalist, and these are the kind of children that I used to look after. But uh, I recommend you both look at the Jap Japanese system in which there's uh, uh, a compensation agreed straight away in, in a, in a no-blame kind of situation that we're going to pay up, we're going to work out what it costs of the life of the child, and we're going to do this in a way that doesn't don't go into legal fees or go into parent time, because actually it's not the legal fees, it's the time for the parents. So as you say, uh, the divorce rate is very high, Terrible. the families break up, the effects on the siblings is great, and none of that is taken into account in the courtroom. Uh, what happens is that you've got to pay for the whole family's rehabilitation, because their whole family is disabled, not only the, uh, the baby is disabled, so it changes their whole life. Yeah. And, and so there are sort of ways of doing it, particularly in, in this kind of one where, you, where our care has got much better, so the babies are becoming children and they're becoming adults. And you've got to look at a long-term plan over many, many years. And one, no one can predict exactly how long that's going to be. Of course not. So, uh, so I agree with both of you. But I'll say there's another system if you look very at the Japanese po very one. Very political. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I know we're at a time. But no, but I, I, I want to save yeah. the last comment for you okay. as the patient, as we always do. OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the answer to the question that uh, John was answering, um, if I understood it correctly, when I left uh, the operating room, from that moment forward, um, MedStar, for the next two and a half years, uh, covered all my expenses. I didn't, you know, um, not a penny out of my pocket. Um, they bought me a new car. They bought me the wheelchair. They provided all my uh, therapy at home. Uh, they provided a... Um, a nurse to come and stay with me um, and to help with my wife. Um, I eventually went to outpatient therapy. They covered all that. So for two and a half years, they provided me with everything that I needed um, and was very grateful for. Two and a half years into it, we decided, my attorneys, and my brother happened to be a malpractice attorney, um, and having to work for a uh, reputable, would you agree, John? A reputable <laughs> law firm. Another one other than mine? <laughs> <laughs> Step below yours, but. <laughs> I'll anyway. go with that. All right. Not, not publicly. This is <laughs> private. <laughs> so um, when we went to settlement, uh, we had a monetary figure that we were looking at. Um, MedStar had a monetary figure they were looking at, and we sat down with the mediator, and over the course of uh, six or seven hours, um, we came to what uh, we agreed. Uh, my attorneys and I was a fair settlement, and uh, would cover us for the rest of our lives, and uh, MedStar and the uh, manufacturer of the 
um, device that malfunctioned, um, agreed uh, that they could live with. So, and they did carve out the piece that, uh, for the two and a half years that I was covered. So, um, you know, I think it's fair to say, yes, you can carve out that, and maybe not in all cases, but in my case, yes, I think it was fair to carve out that section that they had provided me. Yeah. Well, great. Please join me in, in thanking this wonderful panel and uh, a lot more work in this area. Thank you, everyone.